following truths recited in this school media documentary are not meant for a politically correct audience. These truths, which grew self-evident more with each passing day, have been told to us by those who died warning us of what our world would become, should we not take them at their word and ignore what endless wisdom was given to us by them. If what you are about to see offends you in any way whatsoever, for any reason at all, then go lay an egg and watch PewDiePie castrate himself on camera. This is your first, last, and only warning. So I can't tell you that I didn't warn you, because you have indeed been warned. I am going to create a Declaration of Independence from King George III, and with it I will write a Constitution and a Bill of Rights that shall come with it, to protect our democracy, which is also our Republic, however long that lasts. Fifty-two years later. Hear ye, hear ye! Andrew Jackson, the man whom many call a jockass, is now President of the United States. Fuck! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest shockumentary. And this one, believe it or not, is the most shocking one of all so far. Now, I say so far because there are going to be others that are more shocking than this one. Okay. So, you people under, do you people have any idea, do you understand the image that you are being shown right now? The very image that you are being shown right now. Friday, June the 18th, the year 1812, the same year of which inspired a man named Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky to write his infamous overture, that centered around the war that happened between that year and 1815. Meanwhile, the guy who started that war was not a person from Russia, was not a person from France. Guess who started the War of 1812? Your eyes are not deceiving you, ladies and gentlemen. The person who started the War of 1812 is, of course, former President Andrew Jackson, the man who killed Thomas Jefferson's creation that would have saw the country soar to heights unparalleled even by the standards of Alexander the Great some centuries before, but because of what Andrew Jackson did on that fateful day, Friday, June the 18th, 1812, when he let the Brits burn down the White House, when he knew it was balderdash, he let the Brits in anyway. And meanwhile, meanwhile, he could have instead, he could have just let a hundred thousand of his own American troops come in 
to war the Brits off. Because there really weren't that many of them compared to the people that were in this country that were in the military at that time. Hundreds of thousands of them. But Andrew Jackson went against James Madison's order to bring the troops to the capital, Washington, D.C., and instead of bringing them there to war the Brits off, he let them say, ah, you can do whatever you want, I don't need you. That's how the first White House was burned down that led to the one that we see today. The first one, of course, we will never see, and I will tell you why. It is so simple, it has been proven time and again in many different ways. Prior prophets like Myron C. Fagan, a playwright, like Nostradamus, a seer, like Einstein, and, and so many other people before or since them have warned us about this. They have tried to help us avoid this, but we wouldn't listen to them. And because of that, this great nation that could have been far greater has officially now become twenty first century Nazi Germany. Yes, that's right. It's a twenty first century modern day Nazi Germany, except it's not World War II anymore. And 1945 and Adolf Hitler died 75 or so years ago. But the person pulling the strings in America are the entire Democratic Party, which are fully and almost entirely inspired by a man who also happened to be the very right hand stooge, the child stooge of the man that was Adolf Hitler. I'm talking about George Soros. And, and by the way, you wonder why everything's going to hell. Do you, do you know why everything's going to pieces in a handbasket? Well, guess what? Now you know why. And I'm going to talk to you guys about it for the next two hours, and you people are going to see personally the very reasons as to why humanity is going to hell in a handbasket. And I don't mean metaphorically or literally. I mean that from a historical standpoint because it's become as if Christ given his life up for us on a cross on Calvary on a crucifix somewhere around 2,000 years ago meant absolutely nothing. You would think, right? The world's greatest nation, the United States of America, we the people, the same nation that stupidly and retardedly elected an illegal immigrant whose parents smuggled him here from Kenya, which is not a part of the United States, by the way, although it may be in any other dimension aside from this one. They elected a man named Barack Hussein Obama II, actual real identity, Barry Sotoro, to lead them to the slaughter, and boy, did he deliver on that. Holy Jesus. The same man that killed our nation was also the same man who killed our nation 190 years later, just in a different form. Who ever said that the spirit of Andrew Jackson didn't live in virtually every single Democrat in D.C., in New York, in California, in the hate groups that have fueled the Democratic Party and entirely funded them, including ISIS, Antifa, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, some of the members of the Republican Party that actually turned out to be Democrats disguised as Republicans, and dare I say it, the World Health Organization, who, as you know, was founded by one George Soros and is being run alongside his son, Alexander Soros, who is of the bloodline of Hitler. 
You people know damn well that I am not making this up because it is the God's honest truth. And it is because I'm not the only person to say this. I'm not the first to say this. Will I be the last? Of course not. I won't even be close to being the last. As a matter of fact, millions of you probably right now are saying the exact same things that I'm saying to you, just in less politically incorrect ways. To meet a social justice warrior standard! Ah, let's go for the social justice warriors! Since when has that helped? Absolutely never. It has helped no one at any time ever. Nobody has benefited from social justice. Nobody will ever benefit from social justice. And it's so-called warriors, which are actually Rothschild-appointed chess pawns in the Luciferian interdimensional summit that is the Committee of 300. And yes, I did just quote a song from a famous Norwegian black metal band. And they're actually a lot more cinematic than another Norwegian black metal band, neither of which I'm going to name because you know who they are. Obviously. Now, on to the main topic of our evening. Why don't we now get to the reasons as to why democracy died on that fateful day sometime in the morning or afternoon of that day in 1812, and has been dying a billion deaths for the better half of 210 years. Let's get started. Okay? Because believe me, you people aren't going to want to miss this. Guarantee you this isn't going to get any more than 50 views on my channel. But it's going to open some eyes. A whole lot of eyes. A great deal of eyes! And you, my fellow YouTubers, my fellow YouTube subbers, the very people who helped you guys become what we are, you're going to be the first to hear it. Because we here at Skull Media Enterprises don't just talk about ourselves, we talk about the people we're supposed to help, namely yourself. We try to reach out to you. Name, of course, that's not to be confused with a show called Reaching Out to the Unfamous, which is a web show that I produce on my channel, by the way. By the way, I'm, I'm the one man behind Skull Media Enterprises because I have the balls and the nuts and the stones to speak the God's honest truth. When no one else will speak it exactly as it's meant to be spoken, who is the one man who for the last five and a half years stood up to the plate and told the God's honest truth for what it is. You guessed it, Kevin the Skull Anderson. Yours truly, me. And I will continue telling these truths until I am dead. Let's get started. You know always that there is a problem in this country, a very very suspected problem, a very suspect problem, the left. You know, the reason why the left are called the left is because they're always wrong. Everything that they say and have been saying for 207 or 8 years now has been complete and utter crap. The reason why the right is known as the right is because everything that they have said since 1812 has been the truth, the entire and whole truth, and nothing but. Okay, here's the deal. If you're on the right side of history, you're a constitutionalist, you're a Republican, a Jeffersonian, you understand that you've got logic. You've got a brain and you use it and you know how to use it. 
and you use it very well. If you're on the wrong side of history, if you're one of the left, you don't have any of these things. Any of these things whatsoever. You are completely sans logic, sans reason, sans knowledge of anything. You have nothing. Except billions of dollars that also happen to be tainted by your so-called Lord and Savior in the Rothschilds and the Committee of 300. Okay. The reason why every single atrocity is being committed to this country and all of us living in it, all of us fun-loving patriots who try everything in our power to uphold our own constitutional rights to help others prevent the same fate that befell Native America when Andrew Jackson did what he did and caused almost 95% of the indigenous to perish during his presidency and in his many, many decades since, living vicariously through the damned souls of every demonic rat in Congress, in Hollywood, in the media, in academia, the works, and the like. As you know, I had two Twitter accounts, two Twitter channels, both of which died the exact same way by violation of the Constitution, not on my end, but on the end of all the soy toy loving Jacksonians who think it's their goal in life to try to make a jackass of us. Meanwhile, they're only making jackasses out of themselves. It is so obvious. And how funny that the term jackass could be used to describe Twitter founder Jack Dorsey. His middle name is Patrick, as I've discussed on my Skull Media franchise. In a show, I believe, called Savage Level Omega Knoll. As you are aware, Jack Dorsey's name being Patrick, of course, is his middle name. I guess we should rename him Patrick Starr, because everything he does, does all harm and no good. Here is the opposite end of that spectrum from so many years and decades ago, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was born February the 12th, 1809. This was three years, four months, and one day short of a week to the latter before Andrew Jackson killed democracy. He died as a result of a Jacksonian following the example of Rothschild and the many despots that would come since and came before him. His name is John Wilkes Booth, by the way. And he killed Abraham Lincoln in a theater. Of all the places, a theater. People were a lot less politically correct then, so of course they had the common decency to offer a $100,000 reward, which I believe is the equivalent of about $3 million now, to anyone who could lead the feds to the arrest of John Wilkes Booth. Of course, they killed him in a barn after they set it on fire, obviously, which was the best thing that could have happened. That was the best case scenario. The worst case scenario, he probably would have killed every Republican in Congress, and we certainly wouldn't have it nearly as well off as we do now. The reason why I'm showing you these very tweets 
to the left corner of me, to the left corner of my person, the Bradford file, John Cardillo, Lisa Mayo Crawley, Laura Loomer, Breck Warsham, Lionel, Soylent Green Productions, username Soul, obviously, Brooks Brown, Megan My Bot, Chuck Calesto, Jim Hoft, the list goes on. Those people are trying to get through your thick skulls the very same truths that I'm telling you now and the same truths that I've been telling you, albeit in less filtered lights for five years and six months. These are the same truths. The very same truths that I have consistently warned you about, but you people do not listen. And because of that, you lose, and you lose, and you lose. You don't want to win. That's why you lose all the time, because you're losers. But guess what? You don't need to be losers anymore. You don't need to be donkeys anymore. You can choose to go the way of Thomas Jefferson and follow his creed and his example long enough to make sure that by the time all this subsides and we don't know when this is going to be, hopefully all this blows over permanently in 2020, when we re-elect Donald Trump for a second term and he fires every single Democrat in Washington except for the ones that sided for him and sided with him, which by the way, as far as I know, are almost literally impossible to come by. There are maybe two, maybe three Democrats that sided with him on key issues like Kavanaugh and the wall. Everyone else he's going to have to fire when he gets reelected in 2020. Regardless, at the end of it, guess what? You people have been falling hook, line, and sinker for the very lies of Andrew Jackson and all things Weishaupt and Rockefeller and Rothschild for 200 and some six or seven or eight or nine or even ten years by this point because you don't want to accept facts. Well, it's too late now because you're going to have to accept facts. The fact is, you don't have to believe in their lies anymore because they were never really right to begin with. They've always been wrong. Abraham Lincoln was everything that was right with this country when he was president. He only lived to see only three months of his second term before he was killed by that bastard, John Wilkes Booth. But what he did in those four years and three months changed the landscape of everything for hell I would say about 50 years. That was of course until Woodrow Wilson stuck his nose in where it never belonged and not only founded the scheming scam that is the Federal Reserve which by the way prints money that is about 99.9% .9 completely counterfeited by Rothschild and the Committee of 300 themselves, and still, he thought it was a good idea. So he gathered Warburg, he gathered Schiff together, he gathered Rockefeller and Vanderbilt, and they all agreed this was the best idea. But they weren't thinking for themselves. They weren't thinking for people like us that break our bodies every day and our necks and our backs and our spines, working 20 some odd hours a day in many cases for nothing on the dollar. We don't even have enough to pay our bills after all that work. And is it even worth it? You bet your ass it is. But at what cost?
the risk of us being permanently disabled, bound to a wheelchair for the rest of our lives? I don't know. I'll let you decide. The point is, Abraham Lincoln was one of the last hopes that this country had. And I say one of the last hopes because Donald Trump, the guy that I was in part responsible for electing, along with 63 million of you, is without a doubt, unquestionably, without any dispute whatsoever, the last hope that we have as a nation. The fact that he is president and Hillary Rodham Clinton is not easily proves that. Let's move on, shall we? Because, I mean, granted, we're not going to have to, I'm not going to waste your time telling you this if it's not true, because you know that everything that I'm saying is true, obviously. Let's move on. Even further this time, back to 1796, four days after his death of a swelling, obligatus, and a significant loss of blood plasma, he was buried on December the 18th, 1799, precisely 22 years and seven months before Jackson let the Brits burn down the White House. George Washington, our nation's first POTUS, delivered his farewell address that would unfortunately and ironically predict the death of Thomas Jefferson's democracy and the true birth of a 206 year long war on terror and usurpation and despotism. What I'm about to read to you is in all likelihood my best interpretation of George Washington's farewell address as I try to speak it in his voice. Keep in mind I am a voice actor. This is what I do when I want to, obviously, because you, you gotta put that stuff in there because because you can't shit out of your ass without it. But the point is, here is his farewell address. I'm gonna quote all this for you right now, and I'm gonna try to say it all in his voice. This is precisely what he wrote. This is, this is exactly it. This is what he said. He warned us. He warned us 220 some odd years ago. We wouldn't take his advice. And this is why things are what they are now. So. I shall take the liberty. Of telling you all. This message. I want you to listen to me very closely. Farewell address, George Washington, and I'm going to try to say it all in his voice. This may take a while. These considerations speak a persuasive language to every reflecting and virtuous mind, and exhibit the continuance of the Union as a primary object of patriotic desire. Is there a doubt whether a common government can embrace so large a sphere? Let experience solve it. To listen so mere to speculation in such a case were criminal. We are authorized to hope that a proper organization of the whole with the auxiliary agenda of governments for the respective subdivisions will afford a happy issue to the experiment. It is well worth a fair and full experiment with such powerful, with such obvious motives to union, affecting all parts of our country while experiencing experiences shall not have demonstrated its impracticability. There will always be reason to distrust the patriotism of those who in any quarter 
may endeavour to weaken its bonds. In contemplating the causes which may disturb our union, it occurs as matter of serious concern that any ground should have been furnished for characterizing parties by geographical discriminations, northern and southern, Atlantic and western, whence designating men may endeavor to excite a belief that there is a real deference of local interests and views. One of the expedients of party to acquire influence within political and particular districts is to misrepresent the opinions and aims of other districts. You cannot shield yourselves too much against the jealousies and heart burnings which spring from those misrepresentations. They lead and tend to render alien to each other those who ought to be bound together by fraternal affection. The inhabitants of our western country have lately had a useful lesson on this head. They have seen in the negotiation by the executive and in the unanimous ratification by the Senate of the treaty with Spain and in the universal satisfaction of that event throughout the United States. A decisive proof how unfounded were the suspicions propagated among them of a policy in the general government and in the Atlantic states unfriendly to their interests in regard to the Mississippi. They have been witnesses to the formation of two treaties, that with Great Britain and that with Spain, which secured to them everything they could desire in respect to our foreign relations, towards confirming their prosperity. Thus, will it not be their wisdom to rely for the preservation of these advantages on the union by which they were pursued? on which they were procured? Will they not henceforth be deaf to these advisers? If such there are, who would sever them from their brethren and connect them with aliens? To the efficacy and permanency of your union, a government for the whole is indispensable. No alliance, however strict, between the parts can be adequate substitute. They must inevitably experience the infractions and interruptions which all alliances in all times have experienced, past, present, and future. Sensible of this monumentous truth and this momentous truth, you have improved upon your first essay. By the adoption of a constitution, a government better calculated than your former for an intimate union and for the effectiveness, security with energy and containing within itself a provision for its own amendment has a just claim to your confidence and your support. Respect for its authority, compliance with its laws, acquiescence in its measures and duties enjoined by the fundamental maxims of true liberty. The basics of our political systems is the right of the people to make and to alter these constitutions of government, but the constitutions which at any time exists to changed by an explicit and authentic act of the whole people is sacredly obligatory for all. The very idea of the power and the right of the people to establish government presupposes the duty of every individual to s obey the established government, to obey it. All obstructions to the execution of the laws, all combinations and associations, under whatever plausible character, with the real design to direct, control, conrugate, or all the regular deliberation and action of the constituted authorities 
are destructive of the fundamental principle and of fatal tendency. They deserve the organized faction to give it an artificial and extraordinary force to put in the place of the delegated will of the nation the will of a party, often a small but awful and enterprising majority, or should I say, minority of the community. Isn't it glad? Aren't you glad I corrected myself so quickly? Anyway, let's continue. And according to the ultimate triumphs of different parties to make the public administration a mirror of an ill-concerted and incongruous projects of faction, rather than the organ of consistent and wholesome plans digested by common councils and modified by mutual interests. Every combinations or associations of the above description may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely, in the course of time and things, to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitions, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. Namely, Barack Obama, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, LBJ, Woodrow Wilson, any of those ring a bell? They're the preservation of your government and the permanency of your present happy state. And towards it, it is requisite, not only that you steadily discountenance irregular oppositions to its acknowledged authority, but also that you resist with care the spirit of innovation upon its principles, however spacious the pretense. One method of assault may be, in effect, in the forms of the Constitution, alterations which will impair the energy of the system, and thus to undermine which cannot be directly overthrown. In all the changes to which you may be invited, remember that time and habit are at least as necessary to fix the true character of governments as of other human institutions. That experience is the sure standard by which to test the real tendency of the existing constitution of a country, that facility in changes upon the credit of mere hypothesis and opinion, exposes to perpetual change from the endless variety of hypothesis and opinion. And remember especially and critically that for the efficient management of your common interests, in a contrast so extensive as ours, a nation and a government of as much vigour as is consistent with the perfect security of liberty is indispensable. Liberty itself will find in such a government with powers properly distributed and adjusted. It shows guardian. It is indeed little else than a name, whereas the government is too feeble to withstand the enterprises of faction to confine each member of the society with the limits prescribed by the laws and to maintain all in the secure and tranquil enjoyment of the rights of person and property. Everything that he said is truth, people. Let's continue. Continue on, Mr. Washington. Lend us your wisdom from the grave. I have already intimated to you the danger of parties in the state with various references to the founding of them on geographical discriminations. Let me now take a more comprehensive view and warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects 
of the spirit of party generally. The spirit, unfortunately, is inseparable for our nature, having its root in the strongest passions of the human mind. It exists under different shapes in all governments, more or less stifled, controlled, or repressed, but in those of the popular form. It is seen in its greatest rightness and demonization, and is truly their worst enemy. The ultimate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries have perpetuated the most hurried enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. But this leads at length to a mere formal and more permanent despotism. The disorders and miseries which result gradually incline the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual, and sooner or later, the chief of some prevailing faction, more able or more fortunate than its competitors, turns the deposition of the purposes of his own elevation on the ruins of public liberty. Without looking forward to an extremity of this kind, which nevertheless ought not to be entirely out of sight or out of mind, the common and continual mischiefs of the party and the spirit thereof are sufficient to make it the interest and duty of a wise people to discourage and restrain it as much as possible. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, ferments occasionally riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which finds a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passions. Thus, the policies and the will of one nation are subjected to the policy and will of another. There is an opinion that parties in free countries are useful checks upon the administration of the government and serve to keep alive the spirit of liberty. This, within certain limits, is probably true, and in governments of monarchical caste. Patriotism may look with indulgence, not with favour, upon the spirit of party. But in those of the popular character, governments purely elective, it is a spirit not to be encouraged, for from the natural tendency, it is certain there will always be enough of that spirit for every solitary purpose, and there being constant danger of excess. The effort ought to be, by force of public opinion, to mitigate and assuage it. A fire not to be quenched, demands a uniform vigilance to protect its bursting into a flame. Last, instead of warning, it should consume. It is important likewise that the habits of thinking in a free country shall inspire caution in those entrusted with the administration to confine themselves within the respective constitutional spheres, avoiding in the exercise of the powers of one department to encroach upon another. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one, and thus to create, whatever the form of government, a real despotism. 
a just estimate of our love of power and proneness to abuse it, which predominates in the human heart, is sufficient to satisfy us of the truth of this position. The necessity of reciprocal checks in the exercise of political power by dividing and distributing it into different depositaries and constituting each the guardian of the public wheel over invasions by the others has been evinced by experiments both ancient and modern some of them in our country and under our own eyes to preserve them must be as necessary as to institute them if in the interest and opinion of the people the distribution modification of the constitutional powers be in any particular wrong let it be corrected by an amendment in the way which our constitution designates but let there be no chance by usurpation for through this and though this in one instance may be the instrument of gold it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed the precedent must always greatly overbalance in permanent evil any partial or transient beliefs which the use can at any time yield. Let's go on with this, shall we? Continue. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism, who should labour to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and to cherish them. A volume should not trace all their connections with private and public felicity, so let it simply be asked, where is the security for prosperity, for reputation, for life? If the sense of religious colligation desert the paths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason, and experience, both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. It is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. The rule indeed extends with more or less force to every species of free government. Who that is a sincere friend to it can look with indifference upon attempts to shake the foundation of the fabric, promote then as an object of primary importance institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge. In proportion as the structure of a government gives force public opinion, it is essential that public opinion should be enlightened as a very important source of strength and security, cherish public credit. One method of preserving it is to use it as sparingly as possible, avoiding occasions of expense by cultivating pace but remembering also that time disbursements are unavoidable wars to prepare, but danger frequently prevent much greater disbursements to repel it. 
avoiding likewise the accumulation of debt. Not only by shunning occasions of expense, but by vigorous exertion in time of peace to discharge the debts which unavoidable wars may have occasioned, not ungenerously throwing upon posterity the burden which we ourselves ought to bear. The execution of these maxims belong to your representatives, but is it necessary that public opinion should cooperate to facilitate to them the performance of their duty, it is essential Essential, I might add, that you should practically bear in mind that towards the payment of debts there must be revenue, that to have revenue there must be taxes, that no taxes can be devised which are not more than less inconvenient and unpleasant, that the intrinsic embarrassment inseparable from the selection of proper objects, which is always a choice of difficulties ought to be a decisive motive for a candid construction of the conduct of the government in making it, and for a spirit of acquiescence in the measures for obtaining revenue which the public exigencies may at any time dictate. Observe good faith and justice towards all nations, cultivate peace and harmony with all. Religion and prosperity and morality enjoin this conduct. And can it be that good policy does not equally enjoin it? It would be worthy of a free, enlightened, and at no distant period a great nation to give the mankind the magnanimous and too noble example of a people always guided by an exalted justice and benevolence. Who can doubt that in the course of time and things the fruit of such a plan would richly repay any temporary advantages which might be lost by a steady adherence to it. Can it be that providence has not connected the permanent felicity of a nation with its virtue? The experiment, at least, is recommended by every sentiment which enables human nature. Alas, is it rendered impossible by his vices? In the execution of such a plan, nothing is more essential than the permanent, inveterate antipathies against particular nations and particular passionate attachment for others should be excluded, and that in place of them, just and amicable feelings towards all should be cultivated. The nations which indulge towards another a habitual hatred or a habitual fondness is in some degree a slave. It is a slave to its animosity or to its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from the duties and its interests. Antipathy in one nation against another disposes each more readily to offer insult and injury, to lay hold of slight causes of umbrage, and to be healthy and intractable, when accidental or trifling occasions of dispute occur. Hence, frequent collisions, obstinate, envenomed, and bloody contests. The nation, prompted by ill will and resentment, often impels to war the government, contrary to the best calculations of policy. The government sometimes participates in the national prosperity and adopts through passion what reason would object or reject. At other times, it makes the animosity of the nation subservient to projects of hostility instigated by pride, ambition, and other sinister and pernicious motives. The peace often, sometimes perhaps the liberty of nations, has been the victim. So likewise, passionate attachment of one nation for another produces a variety of evils. Sympathies for the favorite nation, facilitating the illusion of an imaginary common interest in cases where no real common interest exists, and infusing into one 
the enmities of the other, betrays the former into a participation in the quarrels and wars of the latter without inducement or adequate justification. It leads also to concessions to the favored nation of privileges denied to others, which is apt doubly to injure the nations making the concessions by unnecessarily parting with what ought to have been retained and by exciting jealousy, ill will, and a disposition to retaliate in the position and parties for whom equal privileges are withheld. And it gives to ambitious corrupted or deluded citizens who devote themselves to the favorite nation, facilitate to the betray or sacrifice the interests of their own country without odium, sometimes even with popularity. Gliding with the appearances of a virtuous sense of obligation. A commendable deference for public opinion or a laudable zeal for public good, the base of foolish compliances of ambition, corruption, or infatuation, as avenues to revelant to foreign influences in innumerable rays, such attachments are particularly alarming to the truly enlightened and independent patriot. How many opportunities do they afford to tamper? with domestic fashions to produce the arts of seduction, to mislead public opinion, influence or ow the public councils. Such an attachment of a small or weak towards a great and powerful nation dooms the former to be the satellite of a latter. Against the insidious wills of foreign influence, I conjure you to blame me for the citizens. The jealousy of a free people ought to constantly be awake, since history and experiences prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of republican government. But that jealousy to be useful must be impartial, else it becomes the instrument of the very influence to be avoided instead of a defense against it. Excessive partiality for one foreign nation, an excessive dislike of another cause, those who they actuate to see danger only on one side, and serve to veal and even second the arts of influence on the other. Real patriots who may resist the intrigues of the favorite are liable to become suspected and odious, while its tools and dupes usurp the applause and confidence of the people to surrender their interests. The great rule of conduct for us in regards to foreign nations is in sustaining our commercial relations, to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far we have already formed engagements let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here let us stop. Europe has a set of primary interests which to us have none, or a very remote relation. Hence she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics, or the ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or enmities, or detached and distant situation, invites and enables us to pursue a different course. If we remain one people under an efficient government, the period is not far off when we may defy material injury from external annoyance. When we may take such an attitude, we cause the neutrality we have at any time resolve upon to be scrupulously respected. When belligerent nations, under the impossibility of making inquisitions upon us, will not likely hazard the giving 
us provocation. For when we may choose peace or war, as our interest, guided by justice, shall counsel. Why forego the advantages of so peculiar a situation? Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice? It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world, so far, I mean, as we are now at liberty to do it. But let me not understood, let me be not understood as capable of patronizing infidelity to existing engagements. I hold the maxim no less applicable to public than to private affairs. The honesty is always the best policy. I repeat it, therefore, let those engagements be observed in their genuine sense. But in my opinion, it is unnecessary and would be unwise to extend maxim or to extend them. Taking care always to keep ourselves by suitable establishments on a respectable defensive posture, we may safely trust to temporary alliances for extraordinary emergencies. Harmony, liberal intercourse, with all nations, are recommended by policy, humanity, and interest. But even our commercial policy should hold an equal and impartial hand, neither seeking nor granting exclusive favors or preferences, consulting the national course of things, diffusing and diversifying by gentle means the streams of commerce, but forcing nothing, establishing with powers so disposed, in order to give trade a stable course to define the rights of our merchants and to enable the government to support them, conventional rules of intercourse, the best that presents circumstances and mutual opinion will permit, both temporary and liable to be from time to time abandoned or varied as experience and circumstances shall dictate, constantly keeping in view that it is folly in one nation to look for disinterested favours from another, that it must pay with a portion of its independence for whatever it may accept under that character. But by such acceptance it may place itself in the condition of having given equivalents for nominal favours and yet of being reproached with ingratitude for not giving more. There can be no greater error than to expect or calculate upon real favors for nation to nation. It is an illusion which experience must cure, which a just pride ought to discard. In offering to you, my countrymen, these counsels of an old and affectionate friend, I dare not hope they will make the strong and lasting impression I could wish, that they will control the usual current of the passions or prevent our nation from running the course which has hitherto marked the destiny of nations. But if it might even flatter self, if I may even flatter myself that they may be productive of some partial benefit, some occasional good, that they may now and then recur to moderate the fury of party spirit, to warn against the mischiefs of foreign intrigue, to guard against the impostures of pretended patriotism. This hope will be a full recompense of the solicitude for your welfare, by which they have been dictated. How far in the discharge of my official duties I have been guided by the principles which have been delineated. The public records and other evidences of my conduct must witness to you 
and to the world, to myself, the assurance of my own conscience is that I have at least believed myself to be guided by them. In relation to the steel subsisting war in Europe, my proclamation of the 22nd of April 1793 is the index of my plan, sanctioned by your approving voice and by that of your representatives in both houses of Congress. The spirit of that measure has continually governed me, uninfluenced by any attempts to deter or divert me from it. At the deliberate examination, with the aid of the best lights I can obtain, I was well satisfied that our country, under all the circumstances of the case, had a right to take, and was bound in duty and interest to take, a neutral position. Having taken it, I determined, as far as should depend upon me, to maintain it with moderation, perseverance, and firmness. The considerations with respect the right to hold this conduct, it is not necessary on this occasion to detail. I will only observe that according to my understanding of that matter, that right, so far from being denied by any of the belligerent powers, has been virtually admitted by all. The duty of holding a neutral conduct may be inferred without anything more from the obligation which justice and humanity impose on every nation in cases in which it is free to act, to maintain inviolate the relations of peace and amity to those other nations. The inducements of interest for observing their conduct will best be referred to your own reflections and experience. With me, a predominant motive has been to endeavor to give time to our nation to settle and mature its yet recent institutions, and to progress without interruption to that degree of strength and consistency which is necessary to give it, humanly speaking, the command of our own fortunes. Though in reviewing the incidents of my administration, I am unconscious of intentional error, I am nevertheless too sensible of my defects not to think it probable that I might have committed many errors. Whatever they may be, I fervently beseech the Almighty and beg upon him to avert or mitigate the evils to which they may tend. I shall also carry with me the hope that my country will never cease to view them with indulgence, and that after 45 years of my life dedicated to its service, with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities will be consigned to oblivion, as myself must soon be to the mansions of rest. Relying upon its kindness in this, as in other things, and actuated by the fervent love towards it, which is so natural to a man, he views in it the native soil of himself and his progenitors for several generations. I anticipate, with pleasing expectation, that retreat in which I promised myself to realize without alloy the sweet enjoyment of partaking in the midst of my fellow citizens the benign influence of good laws under a free government, the ever favorite object of my heart, and the happy reward, as I trust, of our mutual cares, labors, and dangers. This document, written and spoken to by George Washington himself, 19th December 1796. At this point, this would have to be around 222 and a half years ago as of me recording this. 
do you realize everything that he was saying was inevitably going to come true because we wouldn't listen to him? Why did we not listen to him? Why did we not listen to George Washington? Why? You know, we, we could have followed an example. We could have followed Washington's example and Jefferson's example and the examples of Lincoln and Eisenhower and Reagan. We could have followed their examples. But now we've got a nation that's deep in crap. And it's not coming out. Now, the thing is, the 12th Amendment. I said previously that the 12th Amendment of the American Constitution was a mistake. Apparently I was wrong. Ralph Rossum in his 2006 article on the 17th Amendment being a huge mistake is much more accurate potentially in my opinion. However, because of the 17th Amendment, our souls aren't going to be determined by those living in just California and New York. So, despite it being a big mistake in some instances, it most likely, in all seriousness, was probably a blessing in disguise of a curse as well. He says that the 12th Amendment's revision of the operation of the Electoral College was clearly necessary given the rise of political parties, and the 14th Amendment was necessary to redeem the Republic from the gravest flaw of its birth. The 17th Amendment's provision for direct election of the Senate, however, was not necessary at all because it eliminated the framers principles and means of protecting federalism and it was at that time a huge mistake then again it's just as much a blessing as it is a curse because as I mentioned had it not been for the 17th amendment New York and California would be responsible for determining every single election and none of us and all the other 48 states and the Virgin Islands would have any say whatsoever we wouldn't have a say see the thing is people often say that there are three branches to this government made to protect our Constitution the legislative which creates laws, the executive, which enforces laws, and the judicial, which interprets laws, or either upholds or strikes the laws down. But the funny thing is, there's also another very, very peculiar thing here that people just don't accept. There's a fourth branch of our government, and that's us. That's you. That's me. That's your family. That's my family. That's us. We are the fourth branch of government. Because how the hell can you have a car if it doesn't have a fourth wheel? You can't drive a car that was made to have four wheels if you're driving them with only three installed and the fourth not even made yet or put in there. You can't drive a four-wheeled car with three wheels. It doesn't make sense. So, if you cannot accept this basic and elementary fact as a general rule of thumb and an overall example of second nature and integrity, then you need to move the hell out of America or shut the hell up. In other words, don't bitch about it. You know, there are, there are many things that the indigenous people of which my European ancestors unfortunately were responsible for coming literally this close to extinction for driving them this close into extinction but these things 
these 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 principles that the indigenous Americans live by. You know, it's 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 really simple. Rise with the sun to pray, pray alone and often. The great spirit will listen only if you speak, meaning God. The Native Americans believed in God too. So if you don't think that they were in any way Christian, chances are you'll probably be wrong. You know, a, another one, it's so simple. Be tolerant of the people who are lost on the path. Ignorance, jealousy, anger, and greed stem from a lost soul. Pray that they'll find guidance, but don't count on it. Search for yourself by yourself. Don't allow anyone else to create your path for you. It's your road and yours alone. Others will walk it with you, but nobody can for you. In other words, in a nation where you're trying to be yourself and everybody's trying to get you to be everybody else, just be yourself. Honor and respect other people's thoughts, desires, and words. Let each person express themselves, no matter how full of shit they are. Of course, nowadays we could exclude any Democrat from that, but that's only the ones that worship Rothschild like a living, breathing God or something. You know, an another, another thing that people so many times refuse to acknowledge. Respect every little thing placed upon the earth. So simple. Never speak of others in a mean way. The negative energy you put out into the universe is going to multiply when it returns to you. And it's going to multiply hard. You know? You know, you know, most Christians get the illusion that suicide or being gay or, or homosexual or sexually confused automatically means that you're going to die and go to hell. The Native Americans didn't think that. They say that all people make mistakes and all of those mistakes can be forgiven. No matter what it is, if it's even if it's suicide, if it's if it's homosexuality, same-sex marriage, it can be forgiven. Even if you're an atheist who doesn't believe in God but allowed your kids to be baptized before you died, your mistake can be forgiven. All you got to do is forgive yourself. And then you got to ask God to forgive you. And the moment that you forgive yourself, he forgives you. You know, the great spirit. Because, you know, that's, that's living proof that they themselves believed in God before the notion of Christianity came to light. Negative thoughts call illness of the mind, body, and soul. In other words, Trump derangement syndrome. In other words, Woodrow Wilson's disease. In other words, Jacksonitis. Practice optimism, okay? Don't be a dick. You know? Don't be a malcontent. Just just have positivity. A little bit of it. Even even if it's even if it's very minuscule at the least. Have some of it, or at least practice it. Another thing, you know, nature isn't for us, but it's a part of us. Because animals, plants, and every other living creature are all part of our worldly family. You know, like, like, like tigers, they're going to be extinct in about 20 years. The last male rhino, or, or I think it was the last female rhino, I forget which, and, and some other form of breed of rhino, went extinct. The last male rhino of that certain species just went extinct. I think I covered it on a recent, on one of those episodes of one of my web shows on YouTube. The thing is, okay, you know what? You know, they said that children are the seeds of her future. Personally, I don't expect myself to ever conceive a child. I'm probably just going to have to adopt one very soon as in about 20 years because I'm I'm just not ready for it now I don't have the money because you know it costs millions of dollars millions of dollars millions of dollars making moves making moves making million dollar moves to raise a kid you understand title some new reference you'll need to plant love in their hearts and shower them with wisdom and precious life's lessons when they're grown give them space to mature of course many people in this day and age will never mature because they're retarded jackasses who vote Democrat. 
but just give them space to mature anyway because what the hell, right? Avoid hurting other people's heart. The poison of the pain you cause will return to you. Be honest at all times, even if you're damned if you do or don't. Honesty and truthfulness are the test of one's will within this world. You gotta keep yourself balanced, work out the body to empower the mind, grow rich in spirit to cure emotional pain, make conscious decisions regarding who you'll be and how you'll react. Be responsible for your decisions, which is what no Democrat in Congress or in this country ever does anymore. Respect the privacy and personal space of those around you. Don't touch the personal property of others, especially holy and religious objects, because that's forbidden. Gee, I wonder who would be guilty of that. Pretty much everybody, right? Because everybody makes mistakes. And all mistakes inevitably are forgiven in the end, eventually, no matter how much time it takes. But the thing is, you can't sell out. You don't, you don't need to sell out to Rothschild, all right? You gotta be true to yourself. You gotta be yourself. You gotta be true to yourself. You gotta be honest with yourself. You can't nurture and help others unless you can help yourself first. It doesn't work the other way around, only in that instance. You gotta help yourself first before you can help others. Respect others' religious beliefs. Don't try to force your beliefs on other people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I was, I was guilty of that at one point. Not nearly as much anymore, but, you know. But, you know, share your good fortune with others. Be charitable. Participate in charity, you know? Basic freaking shit. Basic friggin' crap, you know? Basic crap. Do you understand? I mean, it, it's, 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 it's simple. It is simple. It's so simple to understand. By the way, by the way, you know how I said, you know, I, I, I've been saying to myself for about two years now that I was planning to run for president in 2040. Apparently, there's a guy who's already given me a head start on that named Robert Kiyosaki from Japan, I believe. So Robert Kiyosaki of Kitco.com predicted at the start of 18 what we've come to know all along but refused to accept. That the dollar is pretty much worthless and even weaker than it was, say, 10 years ago. Hell, it's weaker than it was even five years ago. It's weaker than it was yesterday, as a matter of fact. And it's going to very swiftly become pretty much all but worthless in about two decades. Prophecy foretold, still long ignored. WAKE UP! The dollar is worthless, people. The only thing that is of any value is gold or silver or bronze. Stock up on that shit while you can, okay? Now, I don't know about Bitcoin being partially responsible for, for placing the dollar. I just don't see that happening, even though it's a cryptocurrency. Then again, what the hell is that even worth? The hell if I know. But yeah, Robert Kiyosaki. I'm assuming he's from either Japan or China. I forget which. But yeah, he predicted this. These are from his words. I'm, I'm reading specifically what he said. There's a five and a half minute video on Kitco.com's website under the headline, Dollar Will Be Replaced by Gold by 2040. Do you understand? Go check that out. So, you want to meet your new instructor, right? Well, it's, it's, it's not new, that's God. But anyway, you know, that's, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of this whole damn thing. Speaking of which, there's, there's this thing called the, the gold standard. There's this thing called the gold standard. Why don't we just, hell, why don't we get to that? Why don't we get to the gold standard and what it meant for us and why it hasn't existed since 1913? Why don't we just do that? The gold standard is a very popular concept that everybody has abandoned. No country currently backs its currency with gold, but in the past many have, including us, the United States. 
For nearly a half a century, beginning in 1879, America could trade in nearly $21 for an ounce of gold, but Woodrow Wilson killed that in 1913 because they thought it was a stupid idea because it sucked. Turns out, it's the best idea this country's ever had! I want you to hear me out. My list for America's five worst presidents are not going to be based on any poll from any source from any mainstream media outlet minus Fox News because polls are full of shit. They're full of <laughs> right? But you already get that, so it's good. Keep in mind, I planned this out some 30 minutes ago in my head what America's five worst presidents are. I'll give you a hint. Two of them were in the past 30 years. Okay. Between, meaning between 1989 and, and this year, 2019, obviously. But you get it. Right? Okay. I'm just going to get straight to it. No bullshit. Here we go. Number five is a very hard choice because I had to I had to decide between I had to decide between John Tyler, William Henry Harrison, George H. W. Bush, his son Georgie 43, or we'll just call him King George II, because that's what he was. Meanwhile, King George I was his dad, George Herbert Walker Bush. Locally, he's burning in hell. No, he's not. He's, he's probably in heaven. William Henry Harrison, number five. Do you know why? Do you know why I ranked Henry Harrison, William Henry Harrison, number five on this list to round out this top five from best to worst? It's actually really simple, okay? I'm, I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain it to you in such freaking detail. All right, here we go. The reason why I included William Harry Harrison as being number five on the list of my five worst American presidents is because when he gave his inauguration speech, he spent three hours talking in the soaking rain. And that's why he died of pneumonia just a month after he was inaugurated. People don't understand that. Because back in the day where April showers were bringing May flowers, this year in particular, in which he was president for only one month, I think it's 1847 or whatever the hell, but, but basically it was raining, raining, raining unusually hard that month. And William Henry Harrison decided to defy logic and just say, screw it, I'm just going to deliver the inauguration address anyway. And I'm not even going to use an umbrella! Turns out it would cost him his life. He died one month later in office of pneumonia. Okay. Number four is, is actually... Number four is actually really, really, really simple because this man is synonymous with another word that rhymes with the number four and the letter and the num and the word four, but I'm not going to say it here because I want to keep it PG. Okay? Bill Clinton. Number four in my pick of the five worst presidents of all time. I ranked him number four on this list specifically because he was the only president in American history that I know of 
who raped children and adults from both genders. Yeah, this man is certifiably a homosexual child predator. Why the FBI continues to protect him in this protective and pathetic family, I have no idea. Why they continue to even want to further his narrative, I have no idea. But he, his wife, and his daughter can all rot in hell. That's all I'll say about that. Oh, also, on a side note, the reason, another reason why I considered Bill Clinton to be the fourth worst president in history is because he's synonymous with a word. Again, I'm not going to say it. You can, you can look it up yourself. Starts with the word who. You fill in the blanks from there. I'm not even going to explain it any further. Number three. Your favorite president! But he wasn't president because he was a legal alien from Kenya. Barack Obama. Also known as his real name, Barry Sotoro. What? You didn't know he was born in Kenya? Go back to school and learn for something, you shit! Okay. Barack Obama is the third worst president of all time, in my eyes, because he put so many people on foot stamps, literally tens of millions of people had to go on welfare because of his dumb ass. He's, he's basically, he's like James Clyburn, a politician from South Carolina. He's a lot like that that so-called bishop who appeared on Laura Ingram's Ingram Angle show last night on January 23rd, 2019. Because, you know, people like him have a skin color that is very, very resemblant to the crap that I force out of my anus on a daily basis. This guy is a legitimate definition of the word shit. I'm not racist for saying this. I'm not racist, period. I like black people. I just don't like when black people think that they're God and they vote Democrat all their lives. Turns out they're part of the problem and not the solution. So yeah, I like black people, as long as they're Republican. I don't mind being around a black Republican. So yeah, if you don't like it, tough shit. That's all I gotta tell you. Tough shit. Also on a side note, did I mention that the toilet color, that the color of my toilet water in my toilet when I took a crap just an hour ago was blue? That pretty much resembles his blood. He's a blue bud. A crap-skinned, blue-blooded Democrat. But there's two more people, two more people that are supposedly worse than this guy! Who could they be? Alright. I'm not even gonna... Alright. You know, many, many people consider Woodrow Wilson to be the worst president ever, right? They consider Woodrow Wilson to be the worst president ever because he was responsible for abandoning the gold standard and forcing this nation to abandon the gold standard. He was responsible for it. That man... Woodrow friggin' Wilson! Yeah, that's right! Woodrow Wilson! The number two! Yeah. Crap reference, because reasons. Let me, let me, let me explain something to you, alright? Woodrow Wilson is the second worst president ever. There's only one that was worse than him. Do you realize, in addition to killing the gold standard in America, 
he also created possibly the most notorious con spree in the history of the world and the Federal Reserve. Did you people know that? Yeah, I didn't think so. But now you do because you heard it from me and you're going to have to deal with it now. This is, this is the only president in history in America that let his own wife do his job for a year. So yeah, we've already had our first female president. Unfortunately, it was Woodrow Wilson's wife and it was during his presidency that she did for him for about an eighth of his terms in office. An eighth of his entire eight-year presidency. She did that for him because he was too much of a progressive to give a damn. Anyway, I'm going to tell you like it is, all right? Number one worst American president. The worst POTUS in history. And it's not Woodrow Wilson because he's a number two. Because he's the second worst, not the first worst, like so many claim. See, there was one person that set in motion the start of the death of America. And I'm talking about <laughs> King Shit himself. He thought he was King Shit his entire life. And despite being born in America... Somehow, he had the brilliant idea of separating democracy from our republic. He's the one that started Jacksonianism, ladies and gentlemen. He's the one who started it. King shit himself, Andrew Jackson. So he lets the Brits burn down the White House when he knew it was bullshit and when he knew that he could summon thousands of his own troops to ward them off, but he didn't because he's a freaking coward who never took responsibility for his actions. By the way, he participated in the very war that he started in 1812. You know, there's, there's a guy, there was a Russian composer about three decades after Jackson's passing or something like that, that, that wrote an overture based around this. You know, 1812 overture, right? You know, right? You know, that one. He started the war by allowing the Brits to burn down the first White House and participated in it, rallying his own troops to win a war that he started, but they finished it for. Yet he took president, he took precedent and destroyed it. He took credit for the war that he started, but also the war that they ended for him because he wouldn't end it himself because he's a coward. This is the same man responsible for destroying almost the entire indigenous race. Do you know what this piece of shit did? Do you guys know what this moron did? What this jackass did? You'll never guess. Trail of Tears, Indian Removal Act, during his presidency, is the early 1830s. Everybody was all westward ho! Everybody was all westward ho. And yeah, that's a Godfather reference, by the way. By the way, the Godfather was also known as Papa Shango during an earlier run as a professional wrestler, but completely unrelated to this. Although it's probably related now because I just used his catchphrase. Don't sue me, piss. Please don't sue me. Please. Please don't sue me! Anyway. Anyway. Andrew Jackson decided it'd be a good idea the country to expand westward and evict illegally all of the indigenous Americans who founded this country thousands of years before 
to other areas. And now, as a result, after his death and during his life, 100 million Native Indigenous Indian Americans have died because of what that piece of crap did. And now there's only four or five million of them left in existence. It's basically, you know, you know, I can't I can't say this is going to be inspired. I can't say this was inspired by Hitler's Holocaust of the Jews. But this predated it by about 110 years, so it might as well have been, and it might as well have inspired it at the same time. Because see, America was going through what I'd like to call the Second Reich. You know what the First Reich was? I'll tell you what it was. The First Reich was King George III in Europe, and the colonists were being taxed to death without representation. You know, no taxation without representation? Yeah. But, but Andrew Jackson knew that they had made a deal with the Native Americans when they came to this country because the American Indians, who had for thousands of years roamed this land freely, trusted my ancestors and the colonists and the colonists well I, I just mentioned another group of wrestlers names I don't know if I can really but anyway the point is they trust they trusted the colonists and they trusted that they would keep this land sacred and free from harm and to protect the indigenous Americans and themselves at the same time from harm Guess who broke that deal? Yeah, King Shit! Andrew motherfucking Jackson! That's the man who killed democracy. That's the man who was partially responsible for taking us off the gold standard. He's also the man that started the damn thing in the first place. Except it would be a slow burning thing and it would conclude in 19. 13 when Woodrow Wilson did what he did by creating the Federal Reserve we just call it the deep state but but nobody cares so anyway if you don't like this list you can choose not to like it and I can respect you for it but don't bitch about it all right don't bitch about it be a good person. Be a Jeffersonian. Don't be a Jackson. Be a Jefferson. All right, so I know you guys are probably asking me, why do we have to go through this again? Why? Well, I'll tell you. In 2016, one of the biggest election frauds in history took place namely that of Hillary Clinton. She cheated her way into the Democratic nomination and almost cheated her way into the White House like her hubby Bill did 25 years before and her fellow confidant who hired her as his Secretary of State, Barry Sotoro, did just a decade before. The reason why she didn't win is because the Electoral College saw through her bull crap and her politics to show you very vividly that they do not tolerate corruption and fraud, especially of this magnitude. Do you realize? that of the 65,277,750 idiots that voted for her, 
3 million of them were illegal immigrants, and about, I would say, just speculating here, 5 to 10 million others were either votes for people who were dead or people who just didn't exist. Or basically people who stole someone else's identities. So the number that you see at the bottom, 62 million six, actually 62 million 277,750 is actually a lot more like, I would say, 54 million. 277,750 because that's how many idiots believed in her crap and 100 million people chose not to vote in that election which sucks for them because if you don't get off of your couch and you don't vote next year in 2020 to re-elect the greatest businessman the world has ever seen, despite his controversies in Donald Trump, this country is going to end up like North Korea. I'm not saying this to help you. I'm saying this to help you and also to warn you of what's going to happen if you don't take my advice. And as I've mentioned before, this isn't just my advice. This is the advice of quite a few people that I listen to on YouTube, quite a few of my friends on DeviantArt, and a surprising number of people on Fox News, many of whom are conservative. The reason why you need to re-elect Donald Trump for a second term and inevitably his final term as president, as POTUS, is because you need to WAKE UP! Democracy and Rothschild and the Committee of 300 and all of their constituents and counterparts in all these different forms, in all these different lights, are screwing you up the butt, no loop. They're screwing you up the butt, they're lying to you people, and if they get their way in 2020, which they won't if you don't allow them to, and if you do, you're a freaking idiot, and you deserve everything bad that you get. Donald Trump didn't just win the electoral vote on November 12th, 2016. He also won the popular vote, though everybody in the mainstream media wants you to believe otherwise, even though you know, just as I know, and you can see it plain as day, right here, that Trump also won the popular vote too, not just the electoral. There's a 28th Amendment that needs to be added to our outdated Constitution that would otherwise prevent such Democratic Jacksonian levels of fraud from ever happening in this country again. It needs to happen. It has to happen. And if we want to get this country back or if we want any hope of a chance of getting this country back, this 28th Amendment needs to be passed. I know this because I see it every single day as the answer. And you know, you don't have to go to college to know this stuff. You don't even have to graduate high school to know this stuff. Granted, you do have to go through the grade school process until you're 16 in many countries, and then you can drop out and educate yourself on the things that the school won't teach you. 
What I'm trying to say is very simple. It is very adroit. It gets straight to the point. And believe it or not, you people need to know this. November 12th, 2016 was the foundation of the start of the rebirth of Jeffersonianism. The same kind of democracy that helped us for 22 years before Andrew Jackson had to come in and ruin the whole thing. Which is why I named him as America's worst president. And compared to Woodrow Wilson, who completely bankrupted this country alongside Roosevelt, alongside Nixon, alongside Obama, and every single Democratic president south of JFK, Andrew Jackson was responsible during his life and since his death, as I've said very bluntly, responsible for the death of 100 million, with an M, you're not hearing this wrong, your ears and your eyes are not deceiving you, 100 million indigenous, natural born Native Americans of Indian heritage, all of whom had descendants or should I say, whose ancestors and their ancestors were the building blocks of America, which at one point, now that I recall it, was once known as Turtle Island. I saw a video about the Lakota tribe and how abused and how mistreated they were. I'd like to think at some point that they did it to themselves, but in reality, they didn't do this to themselves. The government did. People, there are only four and a half million indigenous American Indian natives left in America. So it is very important that you hear me out. We will never get another shot at saving our country again. And you know how they say every two or four years how this is the most important election in human history? Leading up to now, now that I think about it, what they said back then was a lie. The 2020 elections are the most important election in human history. Not just in American history, but in human history. There will never be another chance like this. Next year will be the start of the 2020 electoral cycle. This year is 2019. As I am recording this to you on this Valentine's Day 2019, as it has taken me a few months to record this documentary for you all, I want you to realize, and you need to allow yourselves to realize, that the spirit of John F. Kennedy is not going to rest in peace until we go out there next year in November 2020 on Election Tuesday or as early as the electoral system will allow us to vote in a landslide Donald John Trump Sr. Now, I know that there are people out there, I know some of you, in fact, half of you, I should say, half of you are probably going to get ticked off about it. The other half about, I would say, 
50%. Half of you are going to get ticked off by this. The other half of you will be motivated. This country has been divided like never before, ever. This country has never been divided. This world has never been this divided specifically, I should say. And it's, it's good that I correct myself before I wreck myself. This world has never been this divided before. It has never been this deep in shit. As much as I hate to say that, it's the truth. The medieval times were less divided than this. The dark ages were less divided than this. And even though we have all this technology, all this advanced knowledge and an artificial intelligence in our computers at our disposal, and I know I said in twice, I probably stammered there for a moment. Even though we have all this artificial intelligence and all this technology and all these advances in medicine and science at our disposal, at the end of the day, it will mean nothing if we do not re-elect Donald John Trump, the 44th man to become President of the United States, serving America's 45th presidency. The reason why I say he is the 44th man to be elected POTUS is because there was a man who is very unanimously mistaken to have cloned himself during or around the turn of the 20th century named Grover Cleveland, who was the only president to serve two separate presidencies. History books in school will not teach you this. That's where I come in. That's where my wisdom and my intellect come in. Natural born intellect. Some people are born with this. Some people are not. But I want you to listen to me very, very carefully. America, you've got to get it together. You've got to get your head in the game. If you don't now, then you will never get another chance like this ever again. It's either now or never, as a tired, horse-beaten adage always tells us. There was even a line in Spongebob where this, this undersea hillbilly fish, before going into an outhouse, said, and I quote, <clears throat> Well, it's now or never. And before you know it, that statement, having reared its ugly head countless times throughout history since it was first said by someone of anonymity, or whatever you call it, because I don't know what to call it anymore. Either way, the first person to ever say that was more than likely an unknown, an anonymous person whose identity we'll never figure out more than likely unless we evolve to where we will be able to figure out this guy's name. What this guy's name, of course, is, is up for debate. But the person who first quoted that must have quoted it many centuries ago. Back when times were a lot simpler, but at the same time, that much harder. So if you haven't figured out by now that the more things change, they stay very much the same. If you haven't figured that out by now, you are an absolute jackass. Things change all the time, but they end up staying very much the same in the end. Another long, overridden, overused 
adage that has constantly reared its head in every aspect of our lives since it was first said allegedly many centuries ago. And there was a man, you know him as Euripides, who lived in the 500s or the 400s BC 1. I can't remember which offhand, but I can tell it was one of the two. He said, straight up, whoever God wishes to destroy, he first makes mad. Ever since it was first said some 24 or 2500 years ago, do you realize that the value of that statement, which was already exponentially worth a lot in value when it was first quoted by Euripides himself, in the 25 or 24 centuries since, it is only exponentially, sharply, and very adroitly rised in value. Quotes like that are priceless, people. And I know that you people are foreign to stuff like this, being told to you with such fancy verbiage, right? The politicians want to brainwash your minds with fancy verbiage and, and refined lexiconical Oxford Dictionary-like wording, but they don't back up anything that they said. That's why they're politicians, because they put politics over everything and everyone else, which includes you. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2020, we are going to see either the rebirth of humanity or the death of it. And you know, technically, technically, we were supposed to have died over six years ago, but because of a misconstrued, misinterpreted prediction originally made by the Mayans, who didn't predict our downfall, by the way, we allowed ourselves to think they did, even though they were only predicting the end of an age and the entry of another one. Do you realize we are now in the age of Aquarius? December 22nd, 2012 marked the beginning of the age of Aquarius. I want you to take this in. I'm not lying to you. I'm not deceiving you. I'm just telling you straight up the facts. In 2020, on Election Tuesday in November of that year, which to the best of my knowledge is a year and 10 months from now, approximately, this country is either going to be reborn and Jeffersonianism is going to wake out of its 207 year old coma and the spirit of John Fitzgerald Kennedy will rest in peace finally or we all die by the very sword that we choose to live by the sword of Davocles known as Jacksonianism or as I like to call it politish or should I say, actually, politics. Jeffersonianism was democracy. Jacksonianism is politics. No more politics. Bring back democracy as it was originally intended. Bring back Jeffersonianism and vote for this very intellectual, well ahead of his time, 73 or 4 year old Donald John Trump Sr., to serve as second and final term of the 45th presidency in American history, having been the 44th man to do it thus far, or we all end up dying at the hands of our own 
mental selective retardation. It is a very simple choice. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You have to make that choice. And as I've gone on for a little over two hours on this, I want to remind you very vividly once more that humanity's future literally hangs in the balance. In the meantime, my next documentary, my next documentary is going to be about something that you also know way too well, and it has something to do with MSM and character assassination. Till then, I have been Kevin the Skull Anderson. You have been my loyal, trusting viewers who have trusted me to take two hours of your time and about six minutes, give or take, to listen to me. And until I do another shockumentary or upload one one, this one's going to be released in March of 2019. The next one in June. I plan to make this a three-month thing. A quarter annual thing. So until then, thank you. And may God save us all. Yeah. <laughs>